Stay tuned after the show for podcast promos from the Unseen Podcast and the Cult of Domesticity. Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. As we're all blatantly aware, humans, even the youngest ones, can equally be counted upon to take another's life. Age, gender, race, religious preference, nothing really matters once one is a murderer. A child killing someone is enough to make us widen our eyes and shake our heads, but this week, it's as disturbing an episode as it's ever been. This is a listener warning. There are no 911 calls, but take heed of the title. If you don't want a thorough explanation of what I mean, please go no further. Should curiosity get the better of you, come on in. Episode 34 Beheaded Part 1 Federico Cruz In 1996, 17-year-old David Crawford of Sparta, Michigan longed to be a Disney animator, putting his vivid imagination and endless creativity to work, turning a passion into a career. But at that moment, the teen was living at Wedgwood Acres, a group home for mentally and emotionally struggling youths. Placed there by his family on a voluntary basis, David was therefore allowed to go off campus for school, attending vocational classes nearby. The teen had a tendency to disappear from time to time, and Wedgwood Acres, located in a suburb of southern Grand Rapids, didn't press the issue too much, since he hadn't been placed there by the court, but by his family. Sparta Township, Michigan had a population of about 8,000 in 1996, and was a pleasant mix of farmers and commuters. On Friday, April 25, 1996, David left Wedgwood Acres to go to his classes, but was instead dropped off by a friend miles away, where he began to wander freely, enjoying his day. As he followed some railroad tracks, he encountered a stranger, 16-year-old Federico Cruz. The path David had taken along the train tracks had brought him directly behind Federico's house. Although he was a bright youngster, he began smoking marijuana at age 13, transitioning quickly into heavy usage of LSD, crack cocaine, and inhalants. He spent less than two weeks in rehab, and episodes of violence led to his first stay in a psychiatric facility where he received a diagnosis of bipolar. As his drug usage increased, his burgeoning violent tendencies became more and more apparent. Federico became known for his explosive temper and was considered by many to be a common bully. He was expelled from school at 15, and his juvenile record flourished, with an assault charge, then charges for breaking and entering and malicious destruction of property. Federico began an alternative school program, caught a second assault charge, then a third assault charge for elbowing a state trooper. By the time David Crawford wandered behind the home the 16-year-old shared with his parents and younger sister, Federico was obsessed with the band Cypress Hill, and was a self-proclaimed Satan worshiper. David had a pack of smokes in his shirt pocket and Federico bummed one. As they smoked and chatted, Federico offered to show him the marijuana plants he was growing over in the nearby woods. As they encountered the tiny plants, David accidentally stepped on one, destroying it, and along with it, any remaining humanity young Federico had in him. In a blind rage, Federico admittedly hit David repeatedly in the head, kicking his head once he fell to the ground. Stepping on David's throat with all of his weight, Federico asphyxiated him. He returned to his house but revisited the crime scene and his victim a few hours later when he removed his victim's head, stabbed him 17 times, and left gaping holes where he tried to remove both David's heart and spine. 17-year-old David Crawford's headless body, fully clothed with cigarettes still in his front shirt pocket, was positioned propped against a tree in a swampland area in those woods. Federico took David's head with him, 
and down to the basement of the Cruz family home. His parents weren't there. This is where the depravity continued. Federico set up a video camera in the basement and put David's decapitated head in view, calling him Eddie and carrying on a conversation with him and with the future audience. He used a sharp blade to cut and mutilate David's head as it sat upon the table and the video recorder ran. He was clearly enjoying himself. He suggested if any viewers were to follow his lead that they should be careful and not to get caught. At one point, he shut the camera off as other family members had returned home. Upon starting it again, he greeted the watchers with, Welcome back to the fucking murder show. Over that weekend, Federico bragged to friends, later bringing David's head with him to band practice and giving the video to a friend. That friend informed Federico's father, Jose Cruz, who then called police. Investigators were able to view the video, which they weren't entirely certain was authentic. Once they received a search warrant and visited the crew's home, it didn't take long for them to understand just how real this situation was. Investigators quickly located David's head in a plastic grocery bag on the ground outside of Federico's bedroom window, realizing everything they had seen on the video and heard from witnesses had been true. They didn't know why or even who the victim was, but they knew how and when. Investigators questioned 16-year-old Federico Cruz for an hour and a half in the basement where the Eddie video was filmed. And why exactly had Federico begun referring to David's head as Eddie once the tape was rolling in the basement? Well, according to Federico's bandmates, the teen was obsessed with the band Cypress Hill, whose mascot was a skull named Eddie. Federico himself told police that he worshipped Satan, that he wanted a real skull to decorate his room with, that he killed David, whom he had never met, as a sacrifice to Satan. Federico showed police where they could locate David's body, and he was arrested and charged as an adult with first-degree murder and mutilation of a corpse. In 1996, he was still eligible for a life sentence without the possibility of parole. The autopsy unearthed a total of 17 post-mortem stab wounds, plus gaping holes in the chest and back where Federico had attempted to remove David's heart and spine. Although the name David Crawford was written inside of the victim's clothing, it took a bit of further digging to completely unearth his identity. You see, Wedgwood Acres had not reported David's disappearance until the Tuesday afternoon following the Friday that he had left for classes and never returned. Police actually discovered his body the same day of that missing persons report, but prior to its filing, no matching fingerprints were found in the system. Once the report came in about a teen missing nearby, details in dental records were used to determine the corpse and head belonged to 17-year-old David Edward Crawford. During his previous hospitalization, Federico had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He told investigators that he regularly heard voices emanating from the TV, radio, and posters on his walls. Those voices told him to kill David and to mutilate his body. Those who knew him sometimes witnessed this behavior, which included bouts of hysterical, unprovoked laughter. This continued throughout his incarceration. When the state psychiatric examiner observed him while incarcerated, he witnessed this strange behavior for himself. Federico told him that he continued to hear voices and that they instructed him to wreak havoc and cause mayhem. He also confided that his mother and father were lucky to even be alive as the voices had repeatedly told him to kill them, though he had so far been able to resist. The state examiner heard how voices and screams plagued him at night, interrupting his sleep, and security camera footage from within the prison seemed to bolster his claims. Following this evaluation, Federico was found mentally incompetent to stand trial. He spent a few medication-free months in the Michigan State Psychiatric Hospital, where he continued to hear voices and remained aggressive. He was by then hallucinating, but was no longer overcome by fits of laughter. 
To be legally competent to stand trial, the defendant must be able to understand the charges levied against him, but also be able to aid in their own defense. Though one may be found incompetent to stand trial, it's possible and often expected that competency be reinstated so that the defendant may stand trial for their crimes. To be legally insane, however, is a completely separate matter. To be criminally insane, the defendant must have been unable to determine right from wrong or control themselves at the time the crime was committed. Not when he was caught, arrested, or beginning trial, but when the crime was committed. To mount an effective campaign of insanity as a defense, Federico's team would need to prove that the day he encountered a friendly kid his age and bummed a smoke from him, he was unable to control himself or know right from wrong. The Eddie Home movie, depicting Federico's heartless mutilation of David Crawford's decapitated head, would become a key factor for both sides in proving or disproving the defense's claim of insanity. While incarcerated and committed to the psychiatric hospital prior to trial, Federico was involved in numerous fights with other patients. Multiple suicide attempts were recorded as well, including an incident where he attempted to hang himself with a t-shirt and another where he seemingly flung himself from a 17-foot high platform while alone and unsupervised. Federico claimed a ghost had pushed him. He also claimed to suffer a memory lapse that rendered him unable to recall the exact circumstances of David's murder. He was evaluated again and found to be competent to stand trial. The state of Michigan hired an expert and he determined that the behaviors exhibited were faked. He did not believe that he met the criteria for legal insanity within the eyes of the law. Trial began in late 1997 following discussions regarding whether the Eddie Home movie would be shown in court. There were fears from the defense that viewers would become physically ill and be traumatized by what they were forced to see. The prosecution contended that the state would only play the video to refute an insanity defense. Defense attorneys felt the video proved that Federico was legally insane that day because what sane individual could commit such unthinkable acts? The prosecution pointed out that not only did he shut the camera off when family members got home, but he instructed viewers not to get caught should they ever murder and mutilate a fellow human being. The state felt that these actions proved that Federico knew what he was doing was wrong and was trying not to get caught. The Eddie Home movie was indeed played in court, although the picture was obscured and the court was only able to hear Federico's conversation with David's head and the audience. The video was 45 total minutes of unimaginable gore filled with cursing and heavy metal music with Federico's cackling peppering his diatribe. The jury reached a guilty verdict in under two hours and Federico received a sentence of life without parole at the age of 18. Jump forward 21 years to November 2018. 39-year-old Federico Cruz found himself once again in court, this time for resentencing. The 2012 Supreme Court ruling made mandatory life without parole unconstitutional for individuals incarcerated as juveniles, except under the rarest of circumstances. Just two years before, the Kent County District Attorney's Office had filed failed motions to prevent Federico Cruz and 12 other incarcerated individuals who they felt fell into that rare circumstance category from being resentenced to anything less than life without parole. Federico Cruz was at the very top of this list, which also included David Samuel, one of the Samuel twins covered on episode 14, Double the Overkill. But here they were again, defendant and the judge who had presided over his original trial. Federico Cruz took the stand for an hour, detailing the circumstances of his childhood leading up to David's murder. He explained how he had changed from the devil-worshipping teenager into a man who donates much of his earnings to feed the children. 
there had been no remorse at the 